Hello everyone. So my name is uh, Nicolas Roussel. I have the pleasure and honor to uh, chair the Technical Advisory Committee of Rylem as, as the chair of TAC, which is a short name for the Technical Advisory Committee. As chair of TAC, I am uh, the chair of the jury of the two main uh, medals, three main medals that we have in, uh, in, in Rylem. Uh, one of them is the famous now and historical uh, Robert Lemmet Medal. And uh, the two medals that we're going to award today are called the Gustavo Colonetti Medals in honor of uh, one of the first uh, president uh, of Rylem. And uh, I can tell you a bit about these three of uh, these uh, two, two new medals. Uh, so first, let me tell you that I joined Rylem as a Rylem officer in 2007 uh, when I myself received the Robert Lemmet Medal. And I can tell you that back then it was far easier to get it. So... Since then, uh, competition has become very tough. The number of candidates has increased a lot. And in the last years, I was uh, sometimes chairing this uh, jury, sometimes contributing to the jury. And we had the feeling some years ago, <clears throat> something like three, four years ago, that the competition was so tough that at the end of the day, we were often selecting someone totally sure of our choices of the last years, I'm not saying anything about that, but we were often selecting people who were very close to the age limit of the medal. Because at this age, in your career, and you know all that, I mean, two, three years is what? Two PhD students that you supervise, they will defend, they will contribute to a few papers, you will write a few papers by yourself, maybe file a patent, write another book. And then it makes a huge difference. And often we had the feeling that we were not giving the medal to the highest potential researcher that we were facing, but giving, in fact, the medal to the oldest one, but still uh, younger than 40 years old. So we decided uh, within Rylem to create these two Gustavo Colonetti medals to be able to make a distinction between researchers below 35 years old and researchers between 35 and 40 years old which allowed us really to have the feeling that we were facing high potential, very uh, brilliant uh, researchers, uh, but who has only one default compared to the others is that they were a bit younger. So it, uh, it opened for us some very, very nice opportunities. We received some very nice applications. Uh, the first uh, Gustavo Colonetti medals were awarded in Detroit to Gorav Sant from UCLA and Enrico Sassoni, uh, who was working in Princeton back then. Uh, no, no, sorry. The first ones were uh, awarded to uh, Susan Bernal and um, uh, Ruben Snellings uh, in, in Lungbu in Copenhagen. Yeah. So we are uh, this year having the third edition of the Gustavo Colonetti medals, and I'm very proud uh, to welcome today our two uh, awardees, uh, so Sergio Cavallero and uh, Didier Snack. And uh, I'm not going to take more time. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. That's the point of this, uh, these lectures as well. And then I will award them the medal. And I'm going to do the same joke I do all the time, which is that I will only award you the medal if the speech is good enough. OK? Uh, and we have two medals. We don't have one medal and then you are in competition, OK? We have two medals, one for each of you. So uh, we're going to start with Sergio. So Sergio, the floor is yours. And I'm really looking forward to hear what you have to say. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Barcelona, a place that has been my, my home for almost 10, no, 12 years now. So it's nice to be here again with you. I'm Sergio Cavallaro. I was a, an academic here, and I recently joined Loughborough University in the UK. And uh, I would like to start by thanking you all for being here and thanking especially Rylam for this award. It's uh, an amazing distinction, and I'm, a, I'm very honored to receive it here, spe especially here in Barcelona, and uh, a place that has so many, so many me meanings for, for me. And I, I, wanted, I wanted to do something to start that I probably won't be able to do again. 
So it's out of protocol, but could we please give a round of applause for Antonio Aguado? A very high, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> I know it's out of protocol, but I really wanted to do it, right? So, so I'm going to talk to you about the uh, connecting underground with fibers today. And I will start with, for me, what is the part of my career that makes me more proud, right? So this is, oh, if it's working, yeah. Oh, it's not working, but... So this is the part of my career I'm most, most proud of, is the collaboration of, with all these people that you see there. And I have to say that all, all I'm going to show you today is not the work of only one person. It's actually the work... I, I haven't counted because there are too many. I, I think in total 55, 56 people, and the number is increasing, hopefully, much more in the next years, right? So uh, I thank them also for the opportunity of presenting this work here today, right? So the presentation will be a little diverse in terms of topics because I have to recognize I'm a little chaotic because we are working with a very interesting field, in a very interesting field. There are a lot of interesting things to be re studied in our work, right? And there are two two, let's say, uh, I think, qualities that bring, bring me here to present this, this award. And I think the first one is the curiosity, right? So you see there, there's somebody looking at a box, and, and, and I think myself as, as this guy there, especially when he's challenged, he wants to do it. If somebody tells him that he can't, he's going to try it harder to do it, just to prove them, prove them wrong. And the second one is related to my background in Brazilian. And I might be in a group of very short number of Brazilians that like research more than soccer, right? So this is my, my, my view. I, I, I love doing research, right? And because of that, I have worked or tried to work in different areas, covering new materials, infrastructure, uh, durability, and modeling. And it has been a very diverse number of areas that I have worked before, uh, up to this, this point. And uh, I'm going to cover, kind of in a chronological order, some of the topics that I have researched. Right? I'm going to start from the start. So you see here, the beginning, when I started doing my civil engineering career, with my civil engineering career. And at, at this moment, I didn't do much research. It was hard work only. You see the helmet there. Uh, but then when we... When I really started was in Londrina, Brazil, when I, I, I could develop uh, with a couple of very good colleagues now in, in Brazil, uh, mixed designs for high performance concrete, new ways of characterizing this material and predicting the performance, right? But it was very incipient, it was the beginning of, of my research. And then I came to Barcelona and here I arrived at a very good moment. You see here, this is the, a graph with the cement production uh, evo evolution since 2006, arrived in 2006. And we were in Spain, one of the uh, biggest cement consumption per capita in the world. You see, I arrived in 2006. You see my effect here, what happened afterwards. You see you have a, a, a very big drop there. But at this moment, we worked a lot with underground construction. Spain was a, a place where we had maybe the biggest number of, of TBMs working in the world back then. And it was a very interesting topic, right? You know how a TBM works for tunneling. So just a brief overview here. You see the tunnel segments being placed and the machine is here. You have excavation phase here and it's extracting material taking outside from the tunnel, and at the same time placing these segments that you see here, pushing the segments to generate enough thrust to move the machine forward. So as you see here, there's a lot of parts working together to construct the tunnel. And there's, there are several problems related back then, technological problems with the construction of these tunnels. Right? So we had problems related to the rings, how they fit together, we had problems related to the joints. We had problems related to the material that are placed here in the contact between segments. 
the material that is placed for water tightness. So there were several problems that we had to address back then, and it was a great opportunity for doing so. I'm going to describe only one of them here. It's, in my opinion, the one with the biggest repercussion in terms of, of uh, performance of the, the tunnel constructed with TBM, which, which is the cracking that appears very often uh, when we are constructing, pushing with the jacks, and, and we see cracking appearing, especially aligned with the axis of the tunnel, right? So this is a very common cracking uh, pattern that we find when we are building this type of, of, of tunnels. So it's important because, especially nowadays, we have very strict durability requirements. We have 150 years. The tunnel is constructed in, in a very harsh environment, right? So it's, it's dangerous, especially if you are working below the water table. If you have cracking, you have probably problems of water ingress. It's a massive investment, so if you don't do it well, it's a, a loss of investment. And with this cracking, we have to multiply this investment to, to compensate, to, to bring up again the durability of our our system. So the idea was to understand how it was formed and how to at least mitigate a little bit the formation of these damages. So we knew that there were structural damages. We knew that these structural damages seemed to be related to some contact deficiencies between the segments. And these contact deficiencies appeared to come from tolerances, from different sources of tolerances that together summed and gave the, the contact deficiencies, but we had nothing to relate them. So the philosophy behind it was if we could simulate the behavior of a joint, we have here two segments in contact, and we apply a force, if there's no deficiency in contact between the segments, they will crack eventually, so we have a cracking load here. If you put a deficiency alpha one here in an angle, they are going to crack at a similar load because the deficiency in this case is very small. If you increase it a little bit more, you're going to see a trend, right? You're going to see, or you might see this type of trends here. So there's clearly a limit value above which the capacity of the segment is reduced significantly. So the first step of the, the, the research was to identify how this happened or this limit, where exactly this limit is for typical tunnels. Right? And we conducted several simulations, finite element simulations, which were complex back then because of the size of the imperfection we were simulating in comparison with the size of the segment. So very small imperfections that we could also measure on site, very big segments in the simulation. Right? And the curves that we obtained were something like this. Fortunately, it matched our, our idea, it should, how it should behave. Right? And for instance, in a point in the top part of the curve, what we would see is that here, the result of the model with the cracking appearing. So in this case, we see cracking being formed. So this, uh, this is the cracking of the segment. But the interesting thing is that for small imperfections, the cracking distributes over the segment without causing critical damage. Right? So this is what happened for very small uh, imperfections. Conversely, for very big imperfections, for instance, this point in the bottom part of the curve here, what we had was a very localized cracking, which for small loading reached a crit critical situation. Right? So we identified that it was possible to, to obtain this type of graphs for different sizes of segment, different conditions, and for the first time we had this as an explanation for the formation of the, the cracking. Of the, of the segments. But this is ju just one part of the problem because we know how big the imperfection has to be to generate cracking. The other question is how this imperfection is formed. And I said before, they come from tolerances. Many types of tolerances. It could be differential shrinkage. It could be uh, the, the tolerance of the molds, the formwork used to produce the segment. So there are many sources of tolerances that are summing together one with the other and they are giving when you place one ring after the other, an accumulation process that increases them by a factor that could range between three and four, right? But we had to understand how this increase would happen, right? So we had 
to de develop several relatively complex equations, starting with probability, distributions, uh, sums, and then integrals of many rings being placed together, integrating the probability, and arriving to what we thought were simplified equations, which were complex even for, for uh, application. But at the end, general recommendations on how to consider these tolerances and how to define if an, a segment is acceptable or not acceptable. So this was an interesting contribution for uh, reducing the, the, the frequency of, of these damages, right? We also worked a lot with fiber-reinforced concrete back then, especially in tunneling, and it's uh, a material that has grown a lot. So here we have the, the, the forecast of growth of fiber, fiber in forest concrete, 7.2%, 7, 7 which is higher than 4.5% of cement growth usage. Uh, and it's interesting because this is telling us that our industry is specializing itself. It's, it's moving towards more added value materials. So it's a trend that has been uh, observed in, in the last, let's say, 10, 15 years uh, a lot. So it's a, a very big market. It's very interesting for, for segments. But there's a problem with fiber reinforced concrete, and it's hard to design because we, uh, not, not the design methodology per se is hard, but uh, what is hard regarding it is that you do a small scale test and you have to design a very big element. And the performance might not match from the small scale element that you test in the lab, a very small beam and the real scale element, because the, the fiber distribution is different mostly. So one of the challenges here was to be able to measure in a very simple way this fiber content, this fiber orientation in the elements, right? In the segments, the big elements that we are going to produce. So we have developed different strategies of doing it, right? To answer questions such as how much fiber, how is it oriented and distributed, and we have worked also on how to consider this distribution in design, right, in a simplified way. Here I'm going to cover only how to measure it. So this is the equipment, or this, the low-cost equipment that we have uh, worked with, developed here uh, by the group. And the most important, I think, is not only the, the, the setup of the test, it's an inductive method, is the, the, the are the equations that are used to transform the data coming out from the equipment, right, and provide fiber distribution, fiber orientation in a 360 degrees, right? So we worked a lot on developing these equations that can be used to predict the fiber orientation. So the equipment works very well. It's placing a, a specimen, in this case it has to be metallic fibers, and you place it inside the equipment, you can measure in three directions, and that's enough. You have the results, you can measure, you have with that fiber content and fiber orientation. So. Uh, this is just a graph to show the equivalence between fiber content and the result from the test, the measurements, the inductance measurement from the test, different types of specimens. You see a very straight line. So there, there is a calibration or a, a, very, a very good relation between the measurement from the test and the fiber content, right? We have tested and, and assessed this accuracy different ways, different temperatures, and the results are always good like that. Right? So we have a reputability of 0 0.05 kilos per cubic meter of fiber, and typical uh, steel fiber, and a trueness of 0.35 kilos per cubic meter, which is very good right? for, for the measurement, considering that we are typically talking about contents above 20 kilos. One of the things that we've done with this is to measure, for instance, the fiber distribution and, and uh, sprayed material. It was a study that we published recently. And what you see here is the orientation number measured with the equipment. So uh, different angles, so we are, let's say we are spinning the specimen that we are measuring and measuring how much fiber is aligned with each angle. And you see that in sprayed concrete, for instance, you have a very high an anisotropy. So you have a certain direction with a lot of fiber aligned with it, but there's a direction that has almost, well, a very small number of fibers aligned with this. And this was what we observed because fibers, when we spray, tend to align with parallel to the surface. It's reasonable, the fiber are getting, fibers are getting there, impacting over at the surface, and spinning, getting parallel to the surface. So the material allowed us, 
or the test allowed us to do this type of prediction, to understand what is happening. And the, the test is now used in many labs uh, in, in Americas, also here in Europe, and in some, in some projects, real projects already for the control of fiber content orientation. We also tried to push a more holistic design or, or a more holistic uh, uh, assessment of fiber distribution using advanced numerical models. In this case, you see here the result of discrete element modeling of the production of a specimen, for instance, in which with small particles, we, together with the fibers, we try to simulate this flow of concrete and predict how the fibers are going to orientate in, in, inside the, the element, right? So in, instead of having to produce uh, elements, we can try to make first predictions with good adjustments using this type of method. And then we can combine this with finite element simulations to predict what will be the mechanical response of the element, simulating fiber by fiber, right? So we have optimized this and obtain, we can obtain results as you see here. This is the crack opening of the element. This is the load applied. And you see the blue line is one of the experimental results. And what you see in the, in the other curves here, all of those are the result of different simulations using the same condition. And it's interesting because every time we run the simulation, since the fiber distribution is relatively different, you have a different curve because the fibers are not located exactly at the same position. So the method or the holistic vision is giving us a, a possibility of measuring variability of the material even, the scatter it might have. And you know that you have height scatter in, in fiber reinforced concrete. It varies depending on the size of the element. It varies depending on the fiber content. You see here a compilation of results from the literature, the coefficient of variation depending on fiber content, different residual uh, uh, strength values. You see that it varies according with fiber content, reducing with fiber content. So we can now with this type of simulation predict the variability, understand how it works, see how it reduces with the size of the element. So you see here the coefficient of variation for different sizes of elements also. And even depending on the fiber content, right? So it's a very powerful tool. It's yet not uh, something that can be widely used for design, but it's, it's on, on the way of getting there. So it's, it's a process of getting it simpler, faster, so we can apply it for predict, without having to produce elements, the fiber distribution. Going back to tunneling, we have, as I showed you before, worked uh, with sprayed concrete. Actually, this is a, a line of work very strong for the group that was initiated by Professor Luis Agulló. And uh, uh, it's one of my, 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 my favorite research topics right now. So it's growing a lot, as you see here also. So compared with fiber and forest concrete, even more, 8% per year. And it's a huge market, as you see there, right? So, we can spray at the lab here at the UPC. We sprayed a lot, many mixes here at the lab of the UPC. Some of those with more success, with less success, as you see here, when we, had, when we have this type of problems of blockage, or when we have, this is me here, just to see that I'm, I'm working there, and you have here the pump. So we had a blockage in the pump, and I was with a, a, a vibrator needle, trying to push it down. And the funny, the funny thing that happened here, I was pushing the vibration needle, down, and when I pushed it up, there was the, the tip of it has, had been removed. So it was inside the pump, and it was pumped out from the system, right? It was quite dangerous, but it's very nice, very interesting. So you pump concrete, you spray it over a surface. It's something that takes a lot of work, but you can get very interesting results because the material is very modified by the process, the process of production. So we, we have worked in the chemical development of new components, initially set accelerator admixtures, then recently more wor working more with the cement side of it. But there are many questions related to, 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 to sprayed concrete. Although it has been around for more than 100 years now, uh, the design of elements made with sprayed concrete is something that is still uh, not as studied as it should be. We are using design uh, guidelines for conventional concrete. Right? We're assuming that they work also for sprayed concrete. So there are questions on how to do design, right? Because we can use it as a structural material. We have used it in many interesting uh, constructions. But 
the question remains, is it applicable? We, we can apply the, the, the design of conventional uh, concrete to spray material. So we have sprayed a lot at the lab, in tunnels also, analyzing different uh, aspects of the mechanical performance of the material. Now I'm, I'm going just to cover two of them, the elastic modules and, and the durability, to give you a glimpse on, on uh, what we've found. For the elastic modules, we have sprayed at the lab, measured the elastic modules for different mixes, different compositions, and we measured it and compared with the prediction of elastic modules using guidelines like Eurocode or the Spanish uh, con uh, concrete instruction or the Model Code 2010, the estimations from these codes. And what we found is that they don't match, right? So they are not working well, the equations that we have for conventional concrete, they're not working well for sprayed concrete. And this also happened in other properties, like shear, it happened in, in, in bond with reinforcement. So the same was observed in, in many areas. But the good news is that it's easy to adapt, right? The formulation that we have, so here, for instance, zero code two formulation. So we can easily adapt them for this type of material to get better adjustment and the, between the measured value and what we can find using the simplified equations from the codes. So it's a good, it's a good, uh, it's a good thing, right? Another topic that has, been not, has not been very well studied is the durability. So in tunnels, especially in tunnels, you have uh, sulfates sometimes in the, the soil, have water because you're constructing sometimes below the water table. So you have the possibility of sulfate attack of your, uh, of your tunnel. And the sulfate attack is, is, is a process in which the sulfates come, uh, come uh, from the outside. They are going to attack the, some of the components of, of, our, of our concrete. So first, probably Portlandite transforming secondary gypsum, then it's going to transform AFM into ettringite, and the transformation of AFM into ettringite, it's a very expensive reaction, producing cracks, generating problems. So the traditional view for protecting our tunnels against sulfate attack, external sulfate attack, was based on the, the, the use of a sulfate resistant cement. So you specify a sulfate resistant cement, right? We have to check if this is applicable for sprayed concrete also, because we, when you spray in a tunnel, you usually add an accelerator, right? And the accelerator might have aluminates in the composition. So the use of a sulfate resistant cement might not be enough to prevent the, the, the degradation of our, uh, of our um, concrete. Here you see the results of compressive tests made in sprayed samples produced the reference one here without any accelerator, and the other two groups here, you have an alkali-free accelerator used to spray in order to accelerate the hardening process as commonly done in tunnels. And you have an alkali-rich accelerator, right? And the orange bars are tested in water, no sulfates. The blue bars are tested in an, in an environment with a lot of sulfates, and what we see is a reduction in strength as a result of exposition, many days of exp exposition. I think this, in this case it was almost 100 days of exposition to sulfates. So you have a very big reduction in, in, in performance, which is very big or even bigger for the mixes with alkali-rich uh, accelerator. So a first important result here, we need to use alkali-free accelerator. It's not a problem in most of Europe, but here in Spain particularly, we, we have been using a lot alkali-free. It's the main accelerator to use, so it's, it's a problem for, for the durability, right? When we continue the accelerated testing and measure the expansion, we saw that the difference between an alkali-free and an alkali-rich was, was there. So you see here the expansion curves depending on the days of exposition. Right? These curves here on the left, on your left, are for the alkali-free uh, accelerator. And on the right, you have for the alkali-rich accelerator. I have to say that all the cements used here may be classified as sulfate-resistant. So you see, sorry, that many of the specimens, in the case of the alkali-rich, fail, but you have big expansions for the one in alkali-free uh, uh, also condition. Right? So then the, the velocity, the ultrasound measurement, the microstructural d damage, confirmed the, the, the damage of the specimens. And we, when we started analyzing the specimens, we saw that, for instance, the reference didn't present damage, significant damage after 365 days of exposition. 
The alkali free, yes, showed small cracks, but the alkali rich gave this result. So right now we are using cement, sulfate resistant cement to protect our tunnels. It's not working, it's not going to work uh, well, especially if you use alkali uh, rich accelerators. So it's not enough to have a sulfate resistant cement. We have to go further. We have to consider the whole mix uh, of our material. And the explanation is because the, the alumina is present in, in, the, in, the, in the accelerator are reacting also. They are pro producing this additional, ex contributing to this additional expansion, right? So there's, uh, uh, there's an explanation related to the amount of AFM available. So it has been widely studied just to, to justify the, the, um, the cause of this additional expansion. We have also tried to change the cement mix to, to reduce this, this likelihood. So this is an equivalent mix here. The only change is that we added, in this case, a little bit more of gypsum in the mix to reduce the content of AFM. And we saw almost no expansion or very low expansion and no cracking in comparison with the equivalent. So it's, it's very easy to, con to, to control this phenomenon, right? And we have done a lot of other studies with sulfate, uh, uh, sulfate uh, the, the sulfate uh, attack impact on, on durability, right? So we have studied the porosity, the influence of porosity, considering different aspects, right? Different water cement ratios. And the conclusion is always the same. The sulfate resistant cement is not enough to prevent this. Right? So there are different aspects that we have, uh, we have researched on this, on this matter. And it's interesting to see that not in, in some of the cases, not the most porous specimens give the worst result. So this here is a very porous specimen that we have forced it to be very porous, the red one. And here you see the expansion of different specimens, the less porous one, the porosity is on the right here, as you see here. The porosity, and you see that the most, more porous one is giving less expansion, less damage than the uh, least, exp least porous one. So sometimes more porosity doesn't mean that we have worse material in terms of durability, right? So it's something that we have to take into account in terms of expansions or even damage. This is ultrasound measurement. You see again, the damage is much lower because the reduction of, uh, of ultrasound measurements is smaller in terms of uh, uh, for, for the more porous, the red one, uh, mix, right? So we, we can have better performance by playing with the mix. So we worked a lot in developing also sim how, uh, ways of, of modeling this process, how to model the, the expansion, right? So developing simplified ways of predicting what will be the durability of the, the segments, or the elements, sorry, with, uh, su subjected to sulfate attack. Right? to be able to distinguish between geometries, to be able to consider different sulfate concentrations. So we have developed several models that could be used for, for doing it, right? for this prediction, and also simplified models that could be with not so complex equations that could be used to predict the durability of our concrete, right? considering the mechanical performance and how the specimen or the element might uh, uh, present damage. Right? So here you see some results on the influence of the aluminate content on cement on the stress strength ratio. So one means that we are going to have cracks. So you see that different contents in aluminate in our cement are increasing, if you increase the content of aluminate, the risk of damages, right? So we can predict it. And interestingly, we found that the 5% that we commonly use uh, is, is a good threshold in most cases, although it may vary depending on the size of the element. So here you have a variation in terms of size like uh, 90 centimeter thickness, 30 centimeter thickness, and you see that it, the, the, the threshold above which the likelihood of damage increases is, is moving. We have also model, I'm now finishing, other fields with this holistic approach. Here you see the simulation of pervious concrete, and we try uh, during the last four years, or even more, five years, to predict from casting to the performance. So simulating from the compaction process to the permeability of the material or the mechanical performance, the damages that are occurring there. So it's an area that we have worked a lot and I think it's very promising for the future. I, I, I hope that we can develop even further the, the simulation, the performance of the material. 
right? So here you see some results of the compaction process. So the strain in during the compaction and the stress applied. The graphs are marking, in, in this case, what we simulated, and the gray area, this, the, the testing, the experimental program. And here you see permeability, for instance, depending on porosity. The, the red dots are the simulation, and the gray dots are the experimental results. So we can get very good fits with this type of holistic vision in which you simulate the whole process of production and, and the performance of the material. There are other fields uh, that we are developing, right? So we started, I started working here with a particle bed printer. We are now talking a lot about 3D printed concrete. We have a, a talk about this by Nicolas uh, later today. So we started here at UPC working with Axiona in the development of the printer of the material used and also uh, the design tools for, for producing or, or for defini defining these elements. Here you see an example of the first uh, uh, footbridge constructed here in Spain and it's near Madrid, right? It has been 3D printed. And now in my new university, I have, I have the luck to collaborate with, with researchers like Simon Austin, uh, Richard Buswell, Chris Goodyear, and we are working a lot with a different type of of uh, printer, in this case extrusion-based printer. And <clears throat> this is an area that has a lot to evolve in the future, especially the design, how to design the elements to consider uh, uh, the mechanical performance, the durability. So it, it's an area that I'm going to work hopefully a lot in the future and keep here the relation with, with the UPC and this, and this topic. Right, so this is all. I, I, I thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you like some of the, 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 the topics that I've, I've shown here. So, uh, thank you very much, Sergio. It was a very uh, interesting, rich, very diverse presentation. We can take time for one question. I'm going to try to keep the very tight schedule that you spoke about. But we can take one question, if there is one. No question? No question. Very good. So you go directly to the medal. <laughs> so just going to make it nice. So it's my pleasure and honor to give you this award uh, in the name of Rylem. And uh, we should look at the camera for the picture. I think a round of applause would be good right now. <laughs>